This video is going to consider the concept of the carbon budget and also the impacts that changes to the carbon budget can have on the atmosphere, the land and the oceans. It's probably worth us starting off by thinking about what we mean by the carbon budget. And we can define the carbon budget, as it says here, as the balance of transfers between stores. So we're really thinking about the balance between emissions or sources of carbon versus the sinks of carbon that exist. The graph on the left hand side of the screen shows us how those emissions, those sources and those sinks have changed over time. It's worth us considering that the scale on this graph works in two ways. So we're really considering the amount of CO2 that is moving either um, on the top half of this graph in terms of emissions, the amount of CO2 being released by certain activities, or the bottom half of this graph looking at the sinks, the stores on the planet that are absorbing the carbon that is being emitted. If we just start by looking at emissions, we can see that we've got this pattern of increase over time. So from pre-industrial times in 1880, very, very few em emissions from fossil fuels and cement, a little bit from land use change. And we can see as we follow that through into the 20th and 21st century, we can see how the emissions from fossil fuels and land use change have increased significantly in the region of about 10 gigatons of carbon per year. That's a total sort of figure for the amount of carbon being released by human activity into the atmosphere. Now, what you'll also notice is that this graph is a little bit of a mirror image. And actually, if we look at the total amount of carbon um, ending up in each of these three sinks, we can see that that also equates to about 10 gigatons of carbon per year as well. And that is because the carbon that we release through human activity ends up in one of these three sinks here. It either um, is absorbed by plants and would become part of uh, this land sink here. It gets absorbed by the oceans and becomes part of that sink, or it stays in the atmosphere. And ultimately, about 50% of all the emissions that we have released um, as a result of human activity, they've ended up being absorbed either by the land or by the oceans. And about 50% of it remains in the atmosphere. What we're going to consider now are the impacts that this change has what happens as a result of increasing carbon concentrations in these three sinks. So firstly, we're going to consider the impact of the changing carbon budget on the atmosphere. We've looked at graphs like this before, where we can see how the concentrations of carbon dioxide have changed over time. So this shows us from 1960 through to 2020, how concentrations of carbon dioxide have changed. And they've gone up from around 320 to over 400, about 410 parts per million. Now that increasing concentration of carbon dioxide within our atmosphere has quite a profound effect. And the main effect that it has is that it results in warming. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. By increasing the concentrations of carbon dioxide, we are enhancing the natural greenhouse effect. We can see on the graph at the bottom here, which shows temperatures uh, between 1880 and 2020, and how they compare to the average for that period. So we can think about the average um, between 1901 and 2000. If we took that average to be zero, has it been warmer or colder than average? And we can see that pretty much predominantly for the first half of that graph up to around about um, 1970, temperatures were below the average for that period. Following 1970, we can see that those temperatures are significantly above average. And there's a very, very significant rise in the temperatures being observed on the planet um, in the last few decades. 
In fact, global temperature has risen by about one degree C since pre-industrial times. So we have, as a result of human activity, caused the Earth's temperature to go up by an average of one degree C. We've also had 19 of the 20 warmest years have all occurred since 2001. So since this period um, on the, the latter part of this graph here, the 19 of the 20 warmest years have all been within that, um, within that period. As a result of these warmer temperatures then, we are also experiencing more evaporation. Um, that leads to higher humidity levels. That's important because water vapour, which is how we measure humidity, is a, is a measurement of the amount of water vapour within the atmosphere. Water vapour is a greenhouse gas and actually contributes to the greenhouse effect. So CO2 itself only causes about 20% of the Earth's greenhouse effect. Water vapour accounts for about 50%. Um, clouds and other gases cause about 25% of that warming. Um, the other 5% is accounted for by other, other minor gases and processes. So we might think that water vapour is the most significant um, gas here rather than carbon dioxide. And we might be thinking about why we actually get so worried about carbon dioxide when water vapour actually accounts for about half of the greenhouse effect. What scientists have discovered, it's actually CO2 that sets the temperature. So it's the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that really, really controls the temperature because ultimately the amount of carbon dioxide is controlling the amount of water vapor. So carbon dioxide is absolutely the gas that is driving um, the changes that we are experiencing to our atmosphere. As we saw from the graph at the start of this video, um, some of the carbon that we've emitted to the atmosphere has actually been absorbed by the land, by particularly trees and the biomass um, as a result of photosynthesis. Now we also need to consider how some of these changes that are taking place to the carbon budget, um, such as the increased concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, how they are impacting on the land as well. So one of the most significant impacts that changes to the carbon budget are going to have is that those increased temperatures are going to extend the growing season. So actually plants will be growing for more of the year. Um, and that will ultimately lead to greater productivity. So the, the plants will be growing more, producing more energy, photosynthesizing more, um, and in theory, absorbing more carbon dioxide as, as a result. However, we've also got to consider the fact that um, those warmer temperatures can also actually cause stress to plants. Plants function best when they're in an environment where the temperature doesn't become too extreme. And certainly water availability is also very important because the availability of water is a limiting factor in the process of photosynthesis. So where plants become dry or water stressed, that photosynthesis rate decreases and also plants are more susceptible um, to fire and to insects and disease. Now the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does cause plants to have um, a little bit of a growth spurt, if you like. So we call this carbon fertilization. Um, so by having greater concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plants grow more quickly. Um, and some models predict that plants might grow anywhere between 12 and 76% more if we doubled the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide um, above pre-industrial levels. However, we also need to take into account the points we made earlier about how as temperatures rise, those rates of photosynthesis can decrease. Now, there are some other impacts on the land as well. One of the most notable ones of those is being the melting of permafrost. So as temperatures rise as a result of the enhanced greenhouse effect, the frozen soils in the far northern hemisphere, in the, in the north of Canada and the north of Russia, they melt. Um, and as they melt, they release the carbon that they are storing. 
the permafrost in the northern hemisphere that holds about 1,672 billion tonnes of organic carbon. Um, that's a huge store of carbon um, and if that were to be lost then we would see significant rises in temperature. If just 10% of that carbon was to be emitted to the atmosphere we would see an additional 0.7 degrees C rise in temperature. Bear in mind that all of the carbon added by human activity so far has only caused global temperatures to go up by one degree C. We can see the importance of that store of carbon. The final impact on the land that we need to consider is that the warming of the land um, as a result of the warming of the atmosphere is potentially going to bake the soil um, and that accelerates the rate at which carbon within the soil oxidizes with the oxygen in the atmosphere to form carbon dioxide and therefore accelerates the rate at which we lose that carbon. So we can see that the impact of this change to the carbon budget can also have significant impacts for rates of photosynthesis and for the melting of permafrost. The final set of impacts that we need to consider are the impacts that these changes will have on the oceans. The graph on the left hand side here demonstrates quite nicely this relationship that we have between the amount of carbon dioxide in um, the air and indeed the amount of carbon dioxide that then gets dissolved into the oceans and the pH of that ocean water. So we can see that as the dissolved carbon dioxide is increasing, the pH of that water is decreasing. So ultimately, um, the ocean water is becoming more acidic or slightly less alkaline technically than it was previously. While this might only look like a very small change on here, um, going from a pH of maybe 8.15 potentially down to 7.85, that might only sound like a very small change, but the creatures and organisms that live in the ocean are very, very finely tuned to a specific pH, and that can cause um, some quite significant impacts. So about 30% of all the CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere, about 30% of that has ended up in the ocean. So it gets diffused naturally into the oceans. The oceans absorb that carbon dioxide. What that does is it creates carbonic acid, which increases the acidity of the water. That's what we've just been looking at um, on that graph. So as a result of dissolving that carbon into the water, we're increasing its acidity. Um, and since 1750, the pH has dropped by 0.1, which although it might not sound very much, that's actually a 30% change. So, um, we have to be aware of the fact that this change in ocean acidity can have knock-on effects for the organisms that live within the ocean. Um, now, one of the things that happens when ocean water becomes more acidic, it's better at dissolving alkaline minerals like calcium carbonate. Now, calcium carbonate is the main mineral which marine organisms um, make their shells from and those shells can be made weaker as a result of the acidic seawater dissolving them. It's a chemical reaction. Another important factor that we can take into account as well as the acidification of the ocean is that we are losing sea ice. So sea ice in the Arctic has retreated by up to 40% in the last 35 years. Um, this is a result of warmer air temperatures and warmer ocean temperatures as well. Now this is a problem because this can trigger some positive feedback. That sea ice being white and very reflective normally reflects a lot of sunlight. If the sea ice isn't there to, to do that and to act as a, a giant mirror to bounce sunlight away from the earth, we're absorbing that sunlight instead. And as it's absorbed by the oceans and by the land surface, um, we are going to get increased heating as a result. And with increased heating, that sea ice is going to become less common and then we're going to have even more sunlight being absorbed. So we get that positive 
amplifying feedback effect taking place. Another important consideration for the oceans is also um, the impact of sea level rise. So at the moment, sea levels are rising um, at a rate of about three and a half millimetres per year. Um, it's expected that by the end of the century, sea, sea levels will have risen by somewhere between one and two metres, depending on just how much warming we see by the end of the century. That obviously has implications for, for lots of things, but we also need to consider how the melting ice um, from ice caps and glaciers has an impact on ocean salinity. Okay, salinity is the word that we use to describe how salty the water is. So as a result of all the fresh water from ice caps and glaciers going into the ocean, it essentially waters the ocean down a bit. It stops it being quite as saline, quite as salty. That can then go on to have quite significant impacts on ocean circulation. And there are real, real concerns that as a result of um, changes to ocean salinity, we might see the slowing down of certain ocean currents like the North Atlantic Drift, which is um, also known as the Gulf Stream. It's the ocean current that brings warm water up from the Caribbean towards um, Northern Europe and certainly around the UK. The other problem we've got as oceans become warmer is that we could actually see a decrease in the abundance of these microorganisms known as phytoplankton. These are small organisms that photosynthesize um, within the ocean. They grow better in oceans that are cooler and more nutrient rich. And as oceans warm, that's gonna limit um, their ability to grow. And as a result, we're gonna see the ocean's ability to take up CO2 from the atmosphere um, we're going to see that decrease. And again, that could cause some positive feedback. If temperatures warm and the ocean can't absorb as much CO2, then that's going to lead to further warming and even less CO2 being absorbed by the atmosphere. We will look at feedbacks in a future video, but this is an important idea to remember that some of these changes can kickstart some of those positive feedbacks, which can really, really disrupt the natural equilibrium of these systems. So in summary, any increase in the amount of carbon dioxide that's being released by human activity, that is directly counterbalanced by the amount of carbon being stored in sinks, such as the land, the ocean and the atmosphere. As a result of increasing concentrations in the atmosphere, temperatures are rising and that in itself can trigger some of those positive feedbacks that we've mentioned. While we can see plant growth being stimulated by that additional carbon dioxide, which would be a negative feedback, temperature can also um, help to melt that permafrost, which would actually cause a very, very significant positive feedback to occur. We also need to remember that ocean acidification affects marine organisms as a result of carbon dioxide being dissolved into the water, causing it to become more acidic. Sea ice is declining and sea levels are rising, um, which can both affect ocean circulation. And again, feedbacks can also result um, from some of those changes.